last Monday, as we usually do, the clergy meet and have Bible discussion, and, and as we usually do, we focus on the gospel for the coming Sunday. There was not a whole lot of enthusiasm for this gospel, except from me. And I liked it. And I liked it because it had connections with my life. And after a little discussion about this, Shell says, well, why don't you preach? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I don't know that I need to discuss things anymore. <laughs> Whoever comes to me and does not hate, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It was the right thing for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. It did not seem like the right thing to the disciples, but it was the right thing. And Jesus <coughs> knew it was the right thing. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. He knew he must die. And he knew that by his death, generations of people would have salvation. Going to Jerusalem was the right thing. There must have been some of those disciples who were with him who were saying, man, he must hate us to take us to Jerusalem. And that reminds of conversations that, that happen, and I usually think of it as between fathers and sons. But it can be between mothers and sons and mothers and daughters and fathers and daughters. It's a conversation about the expectation of parents for their children and their desire and the desire of their children for a different path. I remember a young man came to me years ago. There was drafting then, and there was a lottery. And he got a low number, which meant he was probably going to be drafted. And he didn't want to go and serve. He thought the war was immoral. And he was going to go off to Canada. And his parents were living. And they asked me to see him, and they sent him to see me. And he said to me, my parents said that if I love them, I won't do that. And he said, they're going to think I hate them. I don't have to give any more examples. I'm sure you've seen television or you've had your own experience of the clash that comes in families when sons or daughters choose to go a different way and the family members feel hated. And yet, and yet, the person who goes a different way needs to know that they think he hates them. And he must accept that as part of the consequence of going his own way. Whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Or as I put it, he who will not pick up his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
Now there's two things about this thing I want to draw your attention to. One, it's picking up an obligation or a course or a direction and it's going someplace. This is not momentary. This is not, well, I think I'll give $10 to the plate this morning. It's not momentary. It has links to it. But it involves you picking it up. And it comes to you, you don't go to it, your cross. You know, there are other passages like feeding the hunger, giving water to the thirsty, or clothing the naked, which you go and do. But in this case, it comes to you. And I'm going to tell you stories about my own life, and Joe's heard them, and some of you have heard them. But they reflect what Jesus is talking about. I finished my first year of seminary. I now was obligated to go and do clinical pastoral education. That means I needed to go to a hospital or a prison or a mental institution and act as a, as a student chaplain. It meant I needed to learn how to do, deal with people who were in need. And I went and worked with six other students under a supervisor who gave us direction. And my job was in Richmond, Virginia. And I had to write verbatim. I had to visit a patient, say what I said and what the patient said on through the conversation and to the end. Then my supervisor would tear me apart. Just to give you an example, a verbatim. Good morning, Mrs. Jones. I'm a student chaplain, and I came to see you. And she says, oh, I'm glad you're here. I just found out that I'm going to have surgery tomorrow, and I'm really scared. And I say, boy, somebody sent you some lovely flowers. Let me tell you, my supervisor would eat me up for that. The lady is trying to express her anxiety about, the, about what she's going to go through, and you divert the congregation because of your own anxiety up to flowers. Or it's like saying, well, what seems to be wrong, Mrs. Jones? And you get a description and you say, oh, my goodness. I think that's called, and I give it a name, and I want you to know, I knew somebody that had that, and they died. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I'm going to be in big trouble. <laughs> and so we were really pressured to learn how to address people in need so that they could bring out what was really troubling them within their lives. And to give them some encouragement. Not to play doctor and make diagnoses, and not to tell results of other cases. Well, we were probably two-thirds of the way through this program. I was feeling good. I was learning a lot. Now we're in the year 1962. And around the country, there are protests being made by African Americans. Buses are being ridden in a way they shouldn't have been ridden. And people were using, going to, African Americans were going to restaurants where they shouldn't go and sitting in. It was a time of protest. Martin Luther King was just now beginning to get to be known. And consciences were being across the country. And I found out, I don't remember how I found out, but I found out that the hospital in which I was serving as a student chaplain had a separate cafeteria for black people. And I was offended. And the cross came to me and was I willing to pick it up. 
And I got three of our other students and said, there's no way that we can integrate the white cafeteria, let's integrate the black one. So we went in there and we ate. We just sat out at a table and ate, that's all we did. And then we left. And that evening we had a special meeting from the supervisor. <laughs> and he said to us, you're never to do that again. You don't know what you're stirring up. Bad things can happen. And the next day, at lunch, I went into the black cafeteria. The other two students who went with me the day before didn't go. But I went in. I picked up my cross and I was going to carry it. And that evening, the supervisor called us together and he said, you all can plan on going home on Friday, the program's closed. Because I told you not to go back in to the black cafeteria. And so on Friday, we all packed up and left. And I found out later there was going to be no more programs for student chapters. And the supervisor had been fired. And when I got to seminary, the officials of the seminary were angry as they could be with me. How, why should I embarrass them? One institution against another. Why couldn't I go along? And I felt like that everyone from the chapel to the hospital administrator to the other students to my seminary professors that they all thought I hated them. So I went through seminary with that cloud over my head. I didn't go looking for a cross. It came to me. I didn't have to pick it up, but I did. I could have laid it down, but I carried it further than others. And people thought that I hated it. Years go by. I get graduated from seminary. I serve in three or four churches. Life is going along fine. I go off to a standing meeting at a group of people in the diocese, the leaders of the diocese, and at Wheeling and Sanskrit. And Walter Michael Jr., a priest younger than me, had just come back from spending two weeks in Tanzania. And he was making a report to the doctors that made to this trip. And he said that there was a phenomenon going on that, the, the, that in Tanzania there was a new church every single week with more than 300 people in it and they were being baptized and they were being confirmed but they had not even yet been instructed because there were no priests to say it. And he needed priests desperately and what he needed from the United States was someone who would teach in their theological college helping to prepare African men to be Anglican priests and to go out and teach those who had become Anglicans. And he said, I can't think of a person in this diocese who would want to do that. That would be career ending. But that bothered me. There was a cross again at my feet. What is it that would stop me? And I came home. My wife was on the 
the couch, stretched out, watching TV. And I think those words that every Jersey wife, spouse, uh, kind of anticipates, honey, what would you think about a move? And my wife, Bertha, turned her face to the TV, looked at me and said, where? And I said, Africa. <laughs> and she turned back around and watched the TV. <laughs> The next, I, I talked to the bishop, told him to warn the secrecy. The next year was spending the time figuring out whether or not I, we would be able to go. What we would, and we learned that we could not take our daughters uh, who were in high school with us. Uh, we would, they would stay in America for two years and they would come over and join us for the third year. Tremendous challenge for my wife. For me, but for my wife. Not so much for me because I had the call. I saw the cross. I wanted to pick it up. She just had me. And that made it hard for her to leave her teenage girls in this country, even with people we trust. And we went up to New York, to the head, an actual headquarters of the Episcopal Church, and we had an interview. And we were told that our lives would be in danger. That they, you never knew in African countries when there might be a civil war. You never knew when you were going to get a disease. And all four of us eventually had malaria. Joanne had, um, I forgot. Hepatitis. What did, I, what did you have? What did you all? Hepatitis. Hepatitis. Yeah. She had hepatitis, yes. Uh, <laughs> we never saw a wild animal or not many anyhow. Uh, except in the game reserve, so we weren't like, probably going to be eaten. But the National Church made it clear that it was a dangerous place and that we had to have our wills made before we could go. So the call came. We could go. We were accepted. We were excited. We had the ordeal of telling our daughters we didn't have a clue until then. And I can tell you they weren't real happy. Uh, <laughs> I think my youngest daughter summed it up and said, if we're not talking about making a joint decision, if Dad says he's going to go, oh, he's going to go. So this is just how we're going to cope with it. Which was true. So, we got everything arranged. Uh, my congregation, God bless them, uh, shows you how much love a congregation can have. I resigned. The Vestry Unanimous would refuse my resignation. <laughs> so I said, well, that's not good. You can't live three years without a rupture. I called a congregational meeting. And I said, my Vestry is wrong, and you need to instruct them. You cannot have an absentee rector for three years. And so we the discussion, and I left so they could talk freely. And I got a knock on the door. They said it wasn't unanimous, it was 66 to 33 that you be given a three-year leave of absence. <laughs> After two years, they knew I they couldn't do it, so they called me and I wrote my resignation and then we, we part of company. But never forget, I'll never forget that gift. And we saw all the hard things that were in Tanzania. The poverty was, and the disease was rampant. It was just, it was not an easy task. But we made it two or three years, and I came home. I picked up a cross, and I went to be a missionary. And on the second week I was there, <laughs> I was out in my backyard, and I was digging a garbage pit. Just two weeks before that, people were hugging me and telling me about how wonderful I was, and wasn't I just great being, being willing to be a missionary? And they were so very proud of me. And then I was digging my garbage pit. <laughs> Where I had all that praise and all that glory. I was digging up a, a garbage pit. And I was sweating profusely. And I thought, oh, this is terrible. And then I thought, all glory belongs to God. And just in that little moment, a 
chill came down my spine. And I, was, I felt confirmed about what I was doing. And then I thought, Jesus picked up his cross in Jerusalem to glorify his Father in heaven. And that's what I'm doing here. Doing my best to glorify my Father who is in heaven. Well, came home, didn't have a job for a while, didn't take me long to get one, but didn't have one for a while. About two weeks in, people convinced me that I ought to go to Perseo. Now, many of you don't know this, this is not popular anymore, but it was an instruction period where people in the congregation would go and be instructed on the faith. Uh, it was actually started out as a Roman Catholic program and came into the Episcopal Church. And people were loving it. People were burning their faith all over again. They were singing hymns of praise. They were dancing together. It was beautiful. And I was invited to go. Well, then they said to me, it'll be unnatural for you. They're going to be talking about commitment and dedication and sacrifice. And you ought to be able to be, be able to plug into all of that. And I thought, yeah, I probably could. So we off to Tercio, and they talk about commitment, which meant going to church every Sunday. They talked about dedication. <coughs> was well, so take a job in the church, be an altar young member, be a choir member, be a Thursday teacher. They talked about sacrifice. You know, surely you can give 10% of your income. And that one divided. I was not happy about that at all. Because I had just come from a country and lived with a missionary for whom commitment and dedication and sacrifice was a whole lot more than this. And yet this is what was being held up as some kind of an ideal. It's like coming to Ash Wednesday. At a time when you're supposed to make a significant sacrifice and you give up candy. And the apostles are asking people to give up their lives and we're asking people to give up candy. Well, I want to say to you folks this morning that the cross will come way. And you'll have to decide whether to pick it up. And you'll have to decide if you're willing to carry it any distance. I chose the hymn to be tonight today. I chose it for the very reason that I've given this sermon. Once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each to blue or blight, and the choice goes by forever twixt the darkness and the light. By the light of burning martyrs, Jesus' bleeding feet I track, toiling up new calories ever with the cross that turns not back. New occasions, Teach new duties. Time makes ancient truths uncouth. They must upward still and onward who would keep abreast of truth. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet this truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. And yet that scaffold Ways of the future, and behind the dim unknown, standing God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own.